So our next, uh, our next speaker is going to be talking about uh, from shallow to deep geothermal heat in crystalline basement rocks. Alan Bischoff. Thank you. So my name is Alan Bischoff, and um, I work in the Energy and Construction Unit of GTK. Uh, we are a small group of about 12 geologists inside of the Energy and Construction. Uh, we have a geoenergy group, and I am the youngest, not in age, you know. <laughs> I am the youngest of the researchers in this group. And our main goal now, we literally want to squeeze you now heat and hot water from the ground. Now, this is what we want to do. Uh, you're going to listen to me saying uh, several times, no, you, I'm going to use the non we, no, we did this and we did that, but I'm just working on for five months in the company. So I'm including myself you know, in the results of the work of my colleagues, and I would like to acknowledge you know, that this work has been done for over 10 years, you know, what I'm going to present here today. So just the presentation outline, now initially we're going to talk about the rationale. Now, uh, should we do it? Now, it's always a good question that we start you know, thinking about, uh, should we do that? Now, should we do go and extract you know, geoenergy from the, the ground? And, and then for that, you know, we will look at the, the general scenario in Finland. Now, what's the heat, uh, what is the energy being extracted, and what can we do more? Now, then we're going to look at some techniques now for geothermal exploration in crystalline rocks. And uh, we will try to answer a question now, now how can we reduce the risk now while we're increasing the rewards? It's been very expensive for the industry now to invest in geothermal energy because of the upfront investment. And as geoscience, now we perhaps we can help a lot of the industry to reduce these risks and to increase the rewards now. And then in, in the end, we will take some uh, uh, take home messages. Uh, trying to answer now a fundamental question of uh, geothermal exploration. Now, is deeper better? Going deep, it is the solution for us now to increase the outcomes. And how about the costs of that? Especially because I'm not from Finland, I'm just arrived in the country a couple of months ago. Was a, a really good learning process for me to try to understand, you know, the energy system and the energy scenario of the country. One of the first things that you can do is to look at where, where is the energy coming from. I'm just trying to figure out here. This, okay. Where is the energy in the country coming from? Now, in this graph here, show the um, energy consumption from the 70s to the 20, 20s. Now, and you can see that um, fossil fuels consumption in Finland has peaked more or less here in 2004, 2005. And then there is a period of ups and downs now. And you can really see that the ups and downs there in the graph is a reflect of coal consumption and gas consumptions. Now, the country went to a period there now in the early and middle 2000s where now they use more coal, use less coal, use more coal and less coal until now you can see that the trend, especially here now in, in the fossil fuel um, uh, use has been reduced significantly. Now, and this is a really good news for the scenario in Finland for the, the decarbonization. Now, you can see that the less use of coal now has been reduced now from the 2000, this is uh, uh, 1990 to the, to the uh, last year, about 34% of, of CO2 emissions. Uh, Finland is going in a really nice track. Now, it's nice to see a country that, that already showing now, uh, this decarbonization process is ongoing. Most of the countries we see, the emissions keep increasing. And that's a reflect of reducing you know, uh, fossil fuels and also you know, increasing renewable sources. In perspective, you now, wood is the one that ho most have grown in the country. But you can see you now this very little line here, this gray line that means others, you now is other renewables. It was almost insignificant you now, 30, 40 years ago. And in proportion is the one that has most grown. Uh, and here is where the, you know, the geoenergy is inside. So everyone might think that Finland don't need to do anything else. And I mean, that might be very dangerous for the scenario that we, we are. We know that we need to really increase the decarbonization uh, um, aims you know, to achieve our targets. Uh, this graph here shows just the coal consumption of, uh, from one year to another. Now, how much more and less coal has been consumed 
in the country. And, and that ups and downs that seems to be flattening now towards the, since the, the, the initiation of the century towards now, now is still there when you look in the tail. Now more coal and less coal have been consumed. And uh, this is about uh, three gigatons of coal now that have been used now in a single year, more or less, uh, which uh, is equivalent to four or eight gigatons of CO2 that's being emitted to the atmosphere. So what's the result of that ups and downs? Now, there is a, a series of key factors, but one of the key factors now from the 2019 to 2020 was that the temperatures now has been uh, dropped signific significantly in 2021. So then people have to put the heaters up, they need to use more energy for space heating, and that is the reflect that we see straight now in the energy consumption of the coal which means that the country is doing right in the decarbonization aims, no, but we still no, relying heavily in fossil fuel energy. We, we are passing this moment of lock-in technology. Now, there is another technology available, no, but because of the prices, no, that we always go back to fossil fuel when we need it. One of the key questions for us is, no, can we keep doing this and for how long? There is an act that was uh, established in 2019 in Finland that the, the Finland's National Act banning coal no, for energy production by 2029. So these ups and downs here, they're going to have to be supplied for somewhere. No, but we're not going to be able to use it coal anymore. You know, so the key, key uh, critical answer for us here that we need to increase the baseline energy supply. And geoenergy you know, is one of these baseline energy that's available now through all the year. So what's our role then you know, in the ge geothermal energy in Finland? 26% of the um, consumption in the country is still you now for using for uh, space heating. So this is, is very large you now for a country like Finland. If you compare to no other countries, you now they don't really need that space heating uh, energy. But in Finland, is uh, the second sector that most use energy. Now, transport in, in the industry, like Simon showed in the beginning of the morning, uh, it's quite hard to decarbonize because there is a series of systems that have to be replaced. Now, but the space heating now, um, in Finland, it's being replaced now, uh, at a certain point now, with uh, air source heat pumps and with ground source heat pumps. Now, and, and this is uh, showing the number of heat pumps, uh, uh, geothermal heat pumps that have been installed in Finland now from the the 1996 now to last year. And I, I really love this graph now because this is an exponential graph. An exponential graph that, that means that changes can be done very quickly. Now you have a number that exponentially grow in a quite short period of time. So that increase, even if it's not that much right now, now that shows that with a short period of time, we can make that change in you know, using a type of energy that seems to not be relevant right now. No. But um, the, the heat pumps, now including geothermal and air source heat pumps, it's supplying a quite large amount of energy in Finland already. You know. In 2021, it was 7 terawatts, which was 2% of the total energy of the country. Now this is quite amazing to think about that the country is using you know, air and geothermal to supply 2% of the energy needs. And in the world, you know, 20 million of households already have you know, uh, geothermal uh, heat pumps installed. So what do we need to go now? What do we need to do now? That market is already being very well established. You now it's gain uh, market. You now even myself, when I was considering to build a house, I went there to talk with the you know, with the house builders, and they say they already have in the package the geothermal you know, heat pump, which for me was very amazing to see the countries really going in that direction. But Finland, you know, it's a, a country with very low geothermal gradient. It's a quite of a frigid granite. I should have put that in the title of my presentation. It's not just crystalline rock, but it's a cold and wall, old one. How can you take heat you know, out of that ground there now, going deep is not as m at the same as in going you now in France or in New Zealand, where you have a high geothermal gradient that quickly you can supply that energy. So, w how can we do you now to upscale the uptake of geothermal energy in the country? 
And that, then we go for the second part, where we talk about the expression techniques you know, and some case examples in Finland where they have already been applying uh, this uh, uh, studies you know, and knowledge to increase then the reward of the geothermal. What has already been done now, now rather than have a single borehole, if you need to amplify you now the heat uh, uh, supply, for example, for large buildings, now is to increase the number of boreholes. So increasing the number of boreholes is, is being done at least now in 45 places in, across Finland. Now all these localities here, now this is the number of boreholes and this is the average depth. You see that they don't go further than 300 meters. This is quite shallow. No geothermal holes, but there is a, a, a large number of boreholes, then they can increase the energy of the, the ground there, the, the, that you can produce. This is an example here in the Alton University, where they, ha they have 74 uh, extraction boreholes uh, for a, a couple of years, I think since 2018 they have been producing. And there is six of these boreholes, they, are, they have a DTS cable constantly measure the temperature. So then what our group did, now this guy here, Sami, he created a, a multi-physics uh, console model now using the thermogeological properties of the area to try to simulate now the heat production and he could compare and validate the model from the boreholes that have been monitoring. This is really important in geothermal, now, it doesn't matter just the models, but we need to validate that models with real situation. And what we, did you see? Now, this is the graph showing then the, the measurements and the modeling, now they have a really nice correlation. So it's showing that the models are supplying good information for us. Now with some ex exceptions, now like here, we can see that in this upper section, now there is a zigzag where is the measure, and this is the model. And then this gives us a clue of what is going on there. We start to investigate that this might be fractures. Now, so even the model can inform us from what's the geological conditions that we should be looking at. And then some of them, you know, like the measure and the model, they just offset the temperature. And we think because there is heterogeneity in the granites, you now from one borehole to another, it might not be exactly the same type of rock. You don't have the same amount of heating. But in general rule, the model have been fitting really well with the um, observations in the boreholes. What is really amazing is that in the, um, the Alt University, now they have been producing an annual average of almost uh, 2,000 megawatts of heat. Now, and they're injecting back now 326. So, of course, now with time, that resource is going to start to deplete. But they are pushing really hard there. 95% now of the, beating, uh, the heating demand of the building is being supplied by the geothermal source. Which again, for me, it's really amazing that that boreholes they can supply you know, energy 95% of a, a large building. The models also help us you know, to inform stakeholders you know, and investors for how long you're going to be able to use that resource. Now here is the time where we have the modeling and the observation together, you now summer and winter. Now, and then from here, you now 2022, the model is showing that because you extract more heat from the ground that you inject, you start to reduce. But if in out university they keep going at the level that they are, which is really high, it's almost 100% of the energy being supplied for geothermal, now they have a, at, at least you know, uh, another decade and a half of supply just for geothermal. Now, what can we do with that? Of course, you know, energy storage is a, is a topic that is really in, in, high, in hype right now. Now people are, are thinking you now how can you put more energy back in the ground there to increase you now the time. And also you can reduce the production you know, if you have another source to supply the heat and then you extend the lifetime of the field. But that of course is not infinite. No. We, we based on, of course in, mo in, uh, in models we have been uh, showing that if you have uh, uh, increasing the number of boreholes, this is what the graph show, now from one borehole to a thousand boreholes in an area of one hectare. Now the average of uh, yield by well, they start to decrease really rapidly when you have the boreholes closer together. So there is limitations for increase the number of boreholes. 
despite of the fact if you have two or three or four boreholes in an area, you're going to have much more outcome of energy. Now, uh, there is limitations that after a certain point of number of boreholes, you're not going to be able to take energy so high from the ground, and that starts to be stable. So increasing the number of the boreholes, it is a good technique to improve the yield, but also no, there is limitation for that, and this is what the calculations are showing us. Even for boreholes that are 300 meter deep, no, 200 and 100, we see the same trend for all of that depth. And this, of course, is because one borehole interacts with another. Now, it starts to extract heat from the ground, and then they start to, to work in a cascade effect that all the boreholes will produce the same amount of energy. So then the next thing you know, that, that a lot of people is looking into is going deep. Now, going deep, of course, you know, there is more geothermal gradient. You're going to have more uh, a production outcome you know, if you go deep. But to what extent here in the Nordic countries and also, I guess, in Estonia, you know, where the, the, the geothermal gradient is not the highest one. Uh, our group then starts to create these um, maps you know, to forecast uh, how much energy there is there in the ground in one cubic kilometer of rock mass. And uh, this is the maps you now from four kilometers to 10 kilometers, showing how, how uh, as you go deep, of course, you have an increase in temperature, but you see that there is anomalies, and everyone knows that this anomalies is related with the types of rocks. Now, so this is the Rapakivi granites, now, and they extend towards uh, Estonia, which it, now, it's a really good situation for you guys to try to target you now this this uh, uh, Rapakivi grains because they produce more heat from radiogenic decay, and this is a map showing the isotherm of a uh, uh, hundred degrees you now in Finland. Now you see that uh, uh, we start to have a uh, hundred degrees temperature uh, in six thousand meters, which is lower here, and, and is is a very uh, deep. Uh, uh, target. Now, if you want to produce electricity, it's almost crazy. You now, in Finland, you're not going to really take that unless you start to go for almost 10 kilometers. And then we go towards you now technologies for drilling. What's the risks? You now, how cost that? But yet, despite of the you know, relatively low potential when you look to Iceland or to New Zealand, there is a potential for space heating, as we talked before. That's what makes an advantage for the cold climate countries. Another study then in more detail tried to understand now this thermogeological parameters together with the engineering parameters. This is really, really important. Doesn't, it's not just the rocks that provide the heat, but depends how much do you extract and how much do you design. So we have a study you know, uh, that was just uh, 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 submitted to publication. Now it's in the process of review right now. That uh, Caio, this, this study taking three areas here in Finland now, from southern Finland to northern Finland, different types of rocks, different you know, temperature outcome that you will need, and he interact all that in, si in simulation scenarios. Now, the results that he showed, you know, the high, just highlighting the results, is that when you have like a, a high flow rate, you, of course, you, know, you take more water from the ground, you take more energy from the ground, you have a higher temperature, now, a higher energy outcome, I'm sorry. Now, which is almost now uh, 1,600 megawatts per hour per year. Now, this is what's going to be for one borehole. Now, in the other hand, now when you have a, a, a high f uh, um, flow rate, the energy amount is higher, but the temperature is lower. So you know, have to, to think about that. You start to lower the temperature quickly, and then your resource now you will exhaust rapidly. When you have a low flow rate. Now, the, the amount of energy, it is lower comparing the high flow rate, but the temperature is higher. Now, so this is one of the outcomes of the result, our results of the, the modeling. Now, but in general, when you come from 600 meters to 3,000 meters deep, you see that in all the scenarios, now you have an increase in the energy outcome of the boreholes. In some of the scenarios, it's, it's almost 10 times more now, if you drill like 600, if you drill 3,000, you're going to have six times more energy coming from a single borehole. Now, and this, of course, now you see here, that is an effect of the 
the thermogeological properties, but it's not straightforward because it, there is so many properties that they are interacting there that some of them doesn't really go you know, from lower to higher, like you're seeing here, you know, from lower to higher. Some of them, uh, uh, there is a higher go lower and higher. And, and this, of course, you know, it's the many parameters that have been modeling together. Now, and that's the importance that we really need to understand the, the thermogeological conditions of the area, looking at the type of rocks to forecast you now the outcome of the energy. Now is perhaps the time to talk about drilling costs you now and how much does it cost for you now a borehole field where we increase the number of boreholes versus you now when you drill deeper. Now about 70 boreholes, what they use in the outer university, 300 meters each at a 35 meters, uh, 35 euros per meter. Now, I'm not gonna say the numbers, <laughs> you can see <laughs> that's what they can get. And if you go deeper, one kilometer to get you now just a little bit more of, of energy, you go for three, if you're very lucky, maybe to five or to six million now. That, that is what is making very hard to increase the uptake of geothermal, geothermal production, is the cost of drilling. Of course, we need to reduce the cost of drilling, but that's geoscience. What can we do now? The cost is a market uh, thing that we have quite low influence. But as geoscience, we can help to increase the re reward. You know? And we keep looking at that. Now, how can we find areas in Finland that can give a highest reward? This is another case study in the Muhus Formation. Now, in this region here in the west, uh, northwest or west of, of Finland, now, where you have a sequence of sediments deposited on a crystalline basement, and the sediments, they, they, they have a thermal conductivity different than the conductivity of the, the granites. So the heat that's being produced in the granites, now we, we have been interpreted, that's being trapped now by that layer that's serving as an isolation now. And this is what the model show. When you have a borehole of about one kilometer, if you have a, a, a thickness of sediments of 100 meters, at one kilometer, that's the highest outcome. Now, if you have a sediment of a thickness of one, uh, much thicker, do you have a lowest outcome, which reverse when you go to two kilometers deep. Now, because you have more insulation, you don't lose that much heating that's coming from the ground. Uh, and then you have more uh, energy output when you have a thicker layer of sediments than when you have a smaller thickness. And when you compare you now that results there with the results from the modeling where we don't have sediment layers at the top now, we see that for more or less now at 2,000 meters, now just two cases here, more or less the same depth, you have a similar energy production, but uh, you need much more, almost the double of the flow rate to achieve that, that energy that you have in the sedimentary cover. So sedimentary rocks covering granites, it's a very good target, now, which is the situation here in Estonia, because the low thermal conductivity of the sediments, it can isolate the heat that will be you know, released to the atmosphere. Otherwise, it's just being condensed you know, in that section there. Uh, this model is being validated for one well, and we are in, in, in discussion how could you, you really uh, validate that model considering another area, you know, where you have and where you don't have that sedimentary cover. Um, another thing that our group is doing is trying to understand you know, the effects of adve advective heat flow. Uh, until now, we just talk about convective heat flow. We know, you know in, the, in, the, in the hype, uh, geothermal industry that, that uh, uh, convection heat flow is what everyone wants because you, know, you increase the energy outcome very rapidly, we increase the area that you can extract. Now, and then uh, uh, Caio also did this really, really nice model that he simplified a lot you know, to understand what's the parameters that control the heat outcome. Now, he put there a block that is a type of a granite and he put, uh, um, uh, create you know, a, a permeable layer. Let's say that you have a one permeable layer inside of a mass of granite that is impermeable. And what the results are showing? Now, at that depth here of 500 meters, now you can see that the advective heat flow is increasing the temperature. Now, that's what you see in there, from here to there, quite nicely. Uh, and then he simulate also you know, how the, 
the hydraulic gradient versus the thickness of that permeable layer, how much the layer needs to be thick or, or short you know, to change the temperature. And he saw that, that in all the situations, you know, when you have a higher uh, hydraulic gradient, this means more water is passing there in the borehole, so more heat is being transferred. You also you know, uh, have a thicker layer. You produce you know, more heat transfer, so more advective heating. Uh, the situation is very similar when you look at depth. Now, this is the temperature and this is the depth. As you go deep and the permeable zones are thicker, now you increase the outcome of energy again. This means now going deeper, but also finding permeability now in the rocks there at the depths is where you can find good targets for geothermal exploration in crystalline rocks. And then looking at porosity versus permeability is a quite similar situation. Now here is the permeability varying. You have more permeability, so more energy out, more, more temperature, and the porosity is secondary. It doesn't really increase that much. The next step of this project now is convert now the energy in, from temperature to how much we actually can produce that into heat. So uh, you might think that I'm crazy in talking about you know, porosity and permeability of crystalline rocks because have, uh, most of people know that the crystalline basement is very low porosity and very low permeability. Now this is what most of the data have been showing. But most of these rocks have been collected you know, from zones that have no fractures and that have no mineral dissolution. More recent studies have been showing now that uh, you can really increase in orders of magnitudes the permeability of crystalline rocks now, when you have now fracturing and alteration. Now, this is a graph showing a granite in France that you move now from very poor permeable rocks to rocks that are as permeable as sedimentary rocks. Now, and then you can think that this is just in the surface. This is an example here in Turku, where you see now the mineral dissolution is forming secondary porosity. But also we have examples now in depths of almost, almost 2,000 meters in some cases. The yellow here is a pore now created by dissolution in fracturing. And this pore here is, uh, is almost 1.5 centimeters across, believe me or not. This is the study that we are doing there in Colisma with the deep hole that have been uh, drilled to uh, 1.5 kilometers deep in a ultramafic and granite sequence, showing this is the fracturing. You know, it, some sections of that borehole is really highly fractured. And we found some rocks that have been uh, highly altered now, and you can see here the porosity is in blue. Now it's, it's almost like a sedimentary rock, and this is actually a granite. The porosity might be about 30% here, or 40 even. And the fractures, they, they are continuous, uh, as you can see in this uh, X-ray tomography. They go all the way across the borehole, they are connected, so this is a really good target for us in the future. And of course, now everyone talk about the engineer systems now, uh, how could you increase by creating fractures there, you know, stimulating the systems uh, chemically, or, or there's some really big innovations uh, that is this design here for Ever Light that's being made in, in Canada right now. They want to drill a, a closed loop borehole that goes to 2,000 meters, 5,000 meters in that case. Uh, all this technology is still just uh, uh, not yet commercial. The take home message then, guys, of course, no, we really need to reduce the cost of drilling. Now, that's the most fundamental thing for growing of the geothermal industry. Now, uh, they, they, uh, that, without plunging that cost, we're not going to achieve upscaling. And of course, now, the, the market, as, you, as more you start to have more drillers now viable and there is more wells to drill, the cost is going to start to go down. Now, these engineering systems, they are a good, good promising for change the game dramatically, but they are still not yet completely viable or commercially. Now, the crystalline rocks, as I say, they can form natural reservoirs. Now, believe me or not, we are doing that. And I say permeability is king. Now, this is what we have been seeing. You need permeability. Natural permeability is better than permeability that you are creating because you just go there and you use the, you know, what the nature is providing. So then, as I say, you know, permeability increase the advective heat transfer, and then, of course, the geothermal energy outcome. And the fundamental question of geothermal exploration, you know, is going deeper better? 
Sometimes it's better, as we saw, I mean, in a technical point of view, it is better, but in an economical, it is tricky. So deeper sometimes is better, but the smarter is always better. Then we need to design our systems very smart to really understand how can you increase the outcome and the rewards of the companies. Now, in that way, they're going to start to invest, and then the drilling costs are going to reduce at the time that we show that the reward is bigger than what they're getting right now. And that's what I have for today. Right. Thank you, Alan. Questions? No questions. I'm not there oh. to make the questions. <laughs> On? Yeah. Leonard Mala from EGT. So how did you found these uh, natural fractures, reservoirs in uh, crystalline rocks? Uh, this is a discussion we have been uh, going for a long time, even in my previous job. Now, my, my job back in New Zealand, uh, I was looking at porosity and permeability of volcanic rocks. Now, at that time, people also think that volcanic rocks is a hard rock. They don't have permeability and porosity. And we start to look at you now several drill holes, you now mostly looking at drill holes and then going to the outcrops and comparing what we could see there. And then building up very large data banks you now to show the cases where you have more porosity and where you have more permeability. But the simple question is you now you need a multi scale study from geophysics now towards the micro scale, really looking at all the aspects, now looking for fracture zones, for proximity with intrusions. Now intrusive rocks, they create stress in the crust and they can create cracks there. Now mostly now in crystalline rocks, you need to try to find the cracks. Now, <clears throat> and then there is two situations that are quite promising here in the, in the countries, Nordic countries. is the crustal fault zones where you have long faults now that go deeper in the crust and, and where you have intrusions that crack the rocks around. But there is no like um, uh, cake recipe for it. You really need to go from the, all the aspects from large scale geophysical studies to the micro scale to find where you have the permeability of these rocks. We're going to put a couple of papers soon uh, showing some cases in, in Finland that Perhaps going to help, you know, to highlight targets for other countries here. Uh, certainly up here up front. Thanks, Alan, for a very, very nice, innovative <laughs> presentation. I enjoyed it very much myself. Just coming back to the permeability question, so uh, geophysics can help us because we know in Finland in ore exploration or mineral exploration that we have <laughs> sometimes discovered with electric, el electromagnetic methods good or semi-good conductors and then we found out that these are just cracks filled with a little bit saline water so these are of course conducting then and, and also seismic studies can show larger uh, conductive uh, structures. But one thing in Estonia, I'm r very much interested in the Rapakevi granites in, in the Tallinn area, because th there you have the sedimentary cover, you have the high heat producing Rapakevi granites, and, and, and then, then uh, in Rapakevi granites you have cubic jointing, and, and, and you, you probably have good water or se <laughs> semi good water conductivity in some areas, so it's, it's, it, these are the most potential sites at the moment. Yeah, the, we are interested to look at the Rapakivi granites uh, close to uh, Turco, uh, mostly at the contacts. Now, what you can you see you now if the contacts between the Rapakivi granites and the host rock are highly fractured? This is one of the, the things that we are proposing to do. You know. We, that's the technique of eating from the borders. You know, that looks like the borders provide you with high fracturing and perhaps not the high outcome. I'm not sure, you know, then the alteration will play a different role because the radio, uh, radiogenic minerals, they're going to decrease. And this is all we're going to have to 
to play with that parameters to see which one is the more promising. But we are really investigating now the role of uh, natural porosity and permeability in crystalline rocks at depths. One last quick question. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation, Edward Bukon from NFIT. I have a question. Uh, are there any issues uh, about, uh, with uh, radon in this uh, topic? Or radon, radium, radon gas. I, I think that you, you bring water from uh, very, very deep. Uh, not that, that at that temperatures now that we are talking here that is uh, uh, about 35 degrees now 80 degrees maximum if, even if you go to six kilometers i haven't heard anything about you know but i, I know that even there is uh, uh, considerations to mine certain elements you know in in high uh, temperature geothermal fluids but that would be like in situations like in iceland or in, in the united states now, personally, I haven't heard any ab about any environmental issues of the water that we'll be producing. And, and also, you know, to keep the geothermal system ongoing, you're going to have to re-inject the water at the same place. We will have now an injection and extraction well. And, and at least at my point of view, uh, um, the environmental impact you now will be uh, in the subsurface, but not at the sur surface. And as much as I know, you know there is no studies or there is no, uh, at that temperature, you know, there is no, um, you know, amount of elements that will be uh, degrading for the environment. You know. This is as, as much as I know. You know. Someone can prove me completely wrong. That's not my field of specialty. Okay. Thank you, Alan.